Good morning, church family. He is risen. Amen. I'm so glad you're here to join us this morning.
invite you to take a moment to greet those around you, and then you may be seated. Welcome and good morning. I'm very happy to be able to greet you all and welcome you to our service this morning. Uh, special welcome to any guests who are with us, uh, those who are joining us online, as well as those on the auditorium. I hope you all feel welcome here. Uh, it's great that we can celebrate uh, our risen Lord on this Easter Sunday. This morning, uh, I got a text first thing in the morning, and he is risen, it said, and so I responded, he's risen indeed. And I, I checked, okay, now, where did that saying occur or originate from? And it, in most cases, um, people agree that it started with the angel telling the women who were at the tomb of Jesus, Matthew 28, he is not here, he has risen, just as he said. And it's thought that Christians then started to greet each other in this fashion, shortly after Christ's resurrection. He is risen means that Jesus has defeated death and offers us the opportunity to share eternal life with him. Christ conquered death, and to those who believe in him, he grants eternal life. A risen Savior changes lives not only for eternity, but right now, today, here on earth. So this is indeed a fact to celebrate. So, one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. What a thing to celebrate. Have a couple of announcements. More than a couple. <laughs> uh, nominations for leadership team are due today, and if you haven't taken the time to fill a, a nomination sheet out um, on the Welcome Center, there are, they are available. Also, young people, this Wednesday, April 3rd, 6 p.m., not 7, 6 p.m., meet at the church, and you need a signed permission slip because you're leaving the church. You're going on a ride. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, just remember that. And then April 10th, a week later, young people, you're meeting at 6 again, but then you're going to get fed supper, so that sounds good deal. Uh, Camp Evergreen, next weekend, ladies retreat. Uh, a month later, the first weekend in May, uh, AGM and work day. And then in June, the second weekend is Father's and Son weekend. So um, uh, lots of things happening at camp. Also at a um, huh, couple of weeks in SunWest Church in Calgary is the Alberta AGM, Alberta Mennonite Brethren Conference. Uh, our delegates have been affirmed, but if you want to attend, uh, you're quite welcome to do that. And uh, just check the online bulletin and there's a place there where you can register and uh, yeah so and if you're planning on spending the night today is the last day to get uh, a reduced rate at the hotel that is mentioned there so uh, yeah it uh, that's something that you want to remember also just one more thing leader ministry leaders that's me included got to get a your church report in by April 14th, so you got a little bit of time, but Diana says sooner the better. At, uh, that way she doesn't get them all at one time. And our AGM is on May 5th. So uh, let's take some time for prayer. <clears throat> I think I've gotten everything I was supposed to get. Probably a few other things. Um, I just want to update you on Brady Bourne. He has had his surgery. He came home. He's doing well. And so, yeah, we're... We'll continue to pray for him. So let's bow for prayer now. Heavenly Father, 
we, uh, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that we can worship you as our risen Savior and uh, help us even today to live for you in all that we do. I want to pray for Dustin Williams, Larry and Brenda's son, and we just pray, Lord, that as he uh, deals with his uh, health issues, that you would encourage him, remind him of your love for him, and I pray that you would be with him and his family. I pray for Sam Gardy, Cardi as he, uh, a young member of our congregation. We pray, Lord, that you would help him to recover from his uh, foot surgery, give him relief from the pain, and I pray, Lord, that you'd help his caregivers to have peace throughout this whole process. We again pray for Brady, and we ask that you would encourage him and uh, his family. Speak to them today, Father, and just guide them as they uh, go through their day. Give them uh, confidence that you are with them. Pray also, Lord, for Mary Bourne, who is uh, in the hospital in Three Hills. We pray that you would just encourage her, uh, keep her mind focused on you, Lord. Father, I also want to pray for Mitch Price and his family. As uh, Mitch goes through esophageal cancer, we pray, Lord, that you would be near to them, encourage them, comfort them, guide them in their day-to-day -day activities. I also want to pray for Lyudmila Olya Martinuk's mother, who is, she is still in Ukraine, and uh, she's in the hospital there. We pray that you would encourage her, give wisdom to the doctors, and I pray for peace for Olya, who is so far from her family. We pray for the rest of the Martinuk family as they settle here, spend time separated from their families in Ukraine. We pray that you would encourage them all. Pray for Mary Dyke, living in the Linden Lodge. We ask that you would give her a good day, and uh, we just pray your blessing on her. Pray for Jill Peters as she studies nursing, and Lord, as she has challenges to her Christian faith. We pray that you would encourage her and help her to remember that you are with her always. Bless her and help her to learn her subjects well. Pray for Trevor and Joan Goddard as they serve with Multiply, and they are in BC at the moment. We ask that you would encourage them, bless them, and um, <clears throat> give them confidence that you are watching over them. I pray for our Canadian Conference of MB Church National Director, Cam Stewart. Father, uh, as he uh, gives leadership to a large conference, we pray that you would encourage him. I pray for our pastors and their families as they serve in our community, as they are involved, and as people see them, we ask that you would just bless them and help them to know how best to go about their day. I pray for those in our community who have unspoken needs. Father, uh, there's nothing wrong with not broadcasting your, your requests, your concerns. And I pray that you would meet these needs where they are at. I pray your blessing on them. I pray for the offering that uh, comes into the church throughout the week. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom for those who manage the church finances. And lastly, I want to pray for Pastor Kerry as he shares with us later on the message on the resurrection. And I pray, Lord, that you would just encourage him and bless him, help him to give, say the words that you want him to say, and help us to be attentive to what you are telling us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, at this time, I've been asked to call the children up up front here for the children's feature. The chicken's gone crazy. What is wrong with this chicken, Dewey? I don't know what his problem is today. Maybe we should ask him. Dewey, he's a chicken. We can't ask him. Oh, yeah, I know how to talk to a chicken. You do? Yeah, it's called chickenese. You know chickenese? Oh, brother. Okay, Dewey. I'm probably going to be sorry, but why don't you ask the chicken what his problem is and why he's so upset today? <sighs> He says that someone stole all the eggs out of the
of the chicken coop. He thinks it was a rabbit. And that rabbit took all those eggs, colored them, and hit them all over town. And he says, <laughs> he says that it's crazy because it's not the meaning of Easter at all. And Tegel Tori don't even remember what the real meaning of Easter is or what the eggs were actually for to start with. Well, you know, I wonder if the kids know what the meaning of, first of all, Easter is. Especially Easter Sunday. Yes, Tristan. Jesus is rise and rex, uh, ra- death and resurrection. The death and re- resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's absolutely right. So who knows what Easter eggs initially signified? Why they were actually used? Who knows that question? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure that I even know. Yes, Tristan. It resembles the rock. Hmm. Maybe we should ask the chicken. He seems to know. He says it represents the new birth and the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. That's why eggs were used to start with. Oh, well, I did not know that, you know. But that kind of reminds me of a Bible verse. And it says, oh boy. (laughs) This Bible verse says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So what if every time we saw an Easter egg we thought about the new life that we have in Jesus. Wouldn't that be a great way to remember an Easter egg and help us to remember how great and awesome it is that Jesus died for us and that he was raised from the dead? And that's really the most important message that there is in the whole entire world. I think that would be a great message. What do you guys think? Yeah, all good. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, what do you think, chicken? He says, that would be a good idea. Okay, well, you know what we did is we brought some Easter eggs. And Kira and Sydney are going to hand them out to you guys. So as you're eating your eggs, remember, this represents the new life that we have in Jesus Christ, these eggs. And I'm just going to pray for you guys. And then maybe after, we need to help this chicken go find his eggs. He says, that's a really good idea. Okay. Okay. God, I thank you for each of these kids. I thank you especially for Jesus Christ, that he came to die for our sins and that he was raised from the dead, God. And what a wonderful gift you have given us. And we just want to celebrate that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your, to your seats, you guys. I just am not even sure how to follow that. Uh, Why don't you stand and let's sing. I stand.
remain standing. We'll do our scripture reading this morning responsively. It is from John 20, verses 10 to 18. Soon. <laughs> Here we go. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So far the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. I have to admit, most of yesterday, I thought it was Monday. But then I realized that Sunday was still coming. And that's not just an Easter joke. I just, I just honestly thought Friday was Sunday. We had a great service here. It was so awesome to see, like, this is packed right now. And there was just extra people on top. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you all for coming. And I just have to thank the worship team and the choir, like the worship this morning, I've just, just so moved by. And hearing the, the good news through those songs, hearing the story through those songs, the, the excellent theological truths through those songs was just a joy. So thank you to the team. This day we celebrate the risen Christ. He is seated at the right hand of the Father in power and glory. The tomb sits empty because our Savior is alive. If you were here on Friday or were watching online, uh, I got a good crack out of um, Clark Malsbury's joke that Jesus just needed to borrow the tomb for the weekend. Our Good Friday service was focused on that theme because of Jesus. We saw how Jesus in his final hours healed the servant, Malchus, making his literal enemy whole. How Jesus went to the cross, though innocent, and prevented Peter from the cross, though he was guilty. That Jesus was laid to rest in a tomb that had been destined for another. And that Jesus reminded Nicodemus of the good news found in John 3.16, the first time they had met, when Jesus said to him, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Because of Jesus, I know that I have been changed. At the end of John 20 here, we are told exactly why John recorded the life and ministry of Jesus. 
At the end of John chapter 20, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wanted to have a clear and concise record of who Jesus is and what he had done during his time on earth so that you may believe. Believe that he is not only the Messiah, the promised king of the line of David, anointed and chosen by God who would come to deliver Israel, but that you would also see and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But it doesn't end there. Belief is the first step of this sentence, and an important one at that. In fact, in Romans chapter 9, we're told that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, I believe it's Romans 10, but if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is where John finishes his sentence. He said, I wrote all of this down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John and Jesus want us all to hear this good news of our deliverance from both the chains of sin and the power of death, all through his death and resurrection, and through that belief that we may receive the new life that he has given us. Because there are people who come to church, who have head knowledge of the Bible, who even do good things but have never actually believed that Jesus is their king and God, who have never bent the knee to him in submission of their own life to him. They carry on doing life their own way, not wanting to give control to Jesus, not willing to walk in obedience to him. And as such, they never step foot into the true life that he offers us. You may have been coming to church for 20 or 40 or 60 or even 80 years and have never come to the point to know the fullness and the richness of being known by God, being adopted as his child. If you are hearing this message today, that means that it's not too late. Because God loves you. God sent his son to die in your place so that you might be saved and enter into his marvelous love. In Ephesians 3, Paul says, It is for this reason that I kneel before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. This was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And we can receive life in his name because Jesus conquered death. The spirit of God raised him from the dead and that same spirit now lives in us. Our passage today begins with Mary having gone to the tomb of Jesus. In Luke 24, Luke's account of this Easter Sunday morning, he mentions that Mary had gone along with other women who followed Jesus. Luke says that Joanna was also there. Joanna's husband was actually the manager of Herod's whole household. Mary, the mother of James, and others along with them. And the women went there together to prepare Jesus' body with spices. As we know from John's description, which we heard on Good Friday, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had already done this back on the day that Jesus died. The 75 pounds of precious spices that Nicodemus had bought for the burial would have been very expensive. In fact, biblical historians estimate the cost 
at 100 times that bottle of perfume from John 12 that the woman had broken and anointed Jesus' feet with. If you recall, back in John 12, Judas had been the one to complain, saying the bottle of perfume she just used was worth a year's wages for a worker. It should have been sold to help the poor. But that means that these burial spices that Nicodemus brought could have cost him what a workman would earn after working for an entire century. This was a lavish honor bestowed on Jesus by Nicodemus. But because the women were not present when the men had done the burial, they did not know that his body had already been anointed in this way. This is why we find them arriving early on Sunday morning, coming to honor their, their deceased Messiah and rabbi with spices that they had prepared themselves. This tells us clearly that they were not expecting to find an empty tomb. The women had waited to come until Sunday because of Saturday's Sabbath, particularly as it was the Passover. In fact, that's another amazing thing that I see about Nicodemus and Yusuf having taken Jesus' body from Pilate and preparing him for burial. Because just the act of entering the courtyard of a Gentile would have made them unclean according to the law. Compounding that was to then touch a dead body in order to prepare it for burial. Contact with the dead body required seven days of purification, according to the law of Moses. The law allowed for the work of burying a body to be performed on the Sabbath, but it did not stop those involved from becoming unclean. That means that these two Pharisees took on this task, took on the cost of the spices, all to honor Jesus, whom they had followed in secret, all while making themselves impure, unable to participate in the Passover meal and celebration with their family. Not to mention them risking their positions on the Sanhedrin, possibly their lives as well, for siding with the blasphemer who their peers had just killed. I know that in contrast to possible death, the act of becoming ritually unclean may not seem significant to us, but I believe it was for the Jews. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a Jewish man who had been robbed and beaten, and he was left lying injured and half dead on the side of the road. A Jewish priest approached, and upon seeing the man, and I think presuming him to be dead, passed by on the other side of the road. Same too with a Jewish Levite who came across the man. But then a Samaritan came. The Samaritans and the Jews were enemies, to say the least. But this Samaritan man stopped and went to the man and bandaged his wounds. He took the man on his own donkey to receive care and treatment at his own expense. The risk of becoming unclean if the man was dead and not injured had these Jewish men refrained from even trying to help their dying brother. Yet the Good Samaritan showed kindness and mercy to him. I believe that Jesus is that Good Samaritan to each of us. Seeing humanity broken and bleeding, helpless and dying at the side of the road, Jesus entered into our story by showing compassion on us, even though we treated him as an enemy. He bound our wounds and carried us to the place of healing covering our debt in the process, paying the cost himself for the healing that we required. Jesus demonstrated this through his life and death. The first and second greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and there's probably another Mary or two, along with them, and then other women, they all arrive at the tomb and find it open, and that the stone had been rolled away. I always wondered how these women had expected to move that stone, and I don't have an answer. Maybe they were hoping that the guards of the tomb would somehow let them in. But on finding the tomb open, they went running inside, and Jesus was not there. And then as we read this morning, two angels appeared before them, gleaming like lightning. And they shared the good news with them. 
Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. The angels then continue wanting to remind the women that Jesus had shared very specifically with them about all that was going to happen. The angel said, remember how he told you when he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners. He will be crucified and on the third day will rise again. At this, the woman remembered his words. The ladies then rushed back into the city to tell the men what had just happened to them. Peter and John take off running. And in John's gospel, there's sort of this humble brag, as he calls himself the other disciple. But the other disciple was faster than Peter. The other disciple got to the tomb first. But John waited outside the tomb, just looking in. Empty tomb. Peter arrives on scene and goes right inside. Just Peter, all in, always. He sees the strips of linen lying there and the cloth that had been about Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went inside. He saw and he believed. But they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. The disciples returned to where they had been staying, still unsure of what was happening, it seems as to what had just taken place. But Mary stayed behind to mourn. It is here, as she weeps over the empty tomb, that the angels return and ask, why is she crying? Mary replies that someone has taken the body and she just wants to know where it is so she can go get him. Turning away from the tomb, she sees a man whom she thinks to be the gardener and questions him as if he might know where the body of Jesus has gone to. But though this man once planted a garden in the east, he was no gardener here among the tombs. Jesus simply calls out her name, Mary. And she knows that this is her Messiah, her King, her God, standing before her now. Mary then rushes back to the others to declare her testimony. I have seen the Lord. Can you imagine the excitement of that moment, of them knowing that he's not there, but where is he, but what's happening? And then Mary saying, guys, I've actually seen him. I got to stand beside him in the garden and talk with him. Her testimony, in fact, to the disciples, is one of the primary pieces of evidence for the historicity of the resurrection. The majority of scholars who have studied the historical evidence, whether Christian or secular, actually agree that the resurrection of Jesus happened. I don't think the secular ones have an answer for how it happened or even what it means. But they agree that the claims that Jesus rose from the dead are historical fact. It is incredibly well documented that Jesus was killed by crucifixion, that the Romans pierced his side with a spear after he died. The evidence demonstrates that there was no other way to account for the disciples and for the hundreds of others who saw Jesus in the very same city where he had been killed two days earlier. Any reliable testimony to the contrary would have stopped the spread of this news. But even the enemies of Christ, the Pharisees, were testifying to the fact that the tomb was empty. They couldn't explain it, but they knew it had happened. Had the body ever been produced, this whole conspiracy would have been brought to rest. And then we have the skeptic James, the half-brother of Jesus, who throughout Jesus' life and ministry had called him crazy and tried to take him back home so that he would stop calling disciples. They didn't believe who he said he was until James saw the risen Lord standing before him, and then he believed. And James became the head of the church in Jerusalem. And then we have a few years later, the great persecutor of the church, the Pharisee Saul, whose course changed in the same way as James after an encounter with the risen Lord. Looking at the evidence objectively through a historical lens has proven the truth of these claims. 
And I think that the testimony of Mary is the capstone of this evidence. If this whole resurrection story was fiction, written to advance the myth that was being purported by the disciples of Jesus, I think the author would have come up with a much more convincing account of the first witness to the resurrection. But to have a woman there by herself be the first witness, I mean, it would never hold up in court. It should have been like all of the remaining disciples were there, along with the Roman guards who were guarding the tomb. And the Sanhedrin was present as well, and they all swear that it happened. And the Pope was there. And, but the fact that the Gospels speak of only Mary being the first to encounter the risen Jesus there by the tomb is the cherry on top for historians to say, this wasn't made up. If it was, they would have come up with a better story for it. But as for myself, I didn't need a historian to confirm that this happened because I know in my heart that my Savior lives. His Spirit testifies to my spirit about this. He speaks that truth. I know that the grave could not hold him, that the enemy could not defeat him. Jesus has conquered sin and death. And now he reigns in victory at the right hand of the Father. Let's worship more today. So we know how the, the story ends um, because of what Jesus has done for us. So why don't you stand as we sing?
our gracious Father in heaven. God, we thank you for the gift, the blessing, the joy of your Son. Jesus, I thank you. Thank you that you submitted to the Father's will. And you cried in the garden, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Jesus, we owe you everything. You are our Lord and Savior and King and our God. May you be glorified through our lives and our death. God, may you receive all the glory. In Christ's name, amen. Happy Easter. Go in peace.